If you have your Bibles, let's go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, your homework this week is to read the whole chapter. It's very, very, it's a very, very good chapter in Philippians chapter 3. I'm only going to read a few passages uh, for time's sake today. Uh, I'm going to go to Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, and read through verse 14, and then we're going to see what God does. Philippians chapter 3, Philippians chapter 3, starting at verse 12, says this, Not that I have already obtained all of this or have already arrived at my goal, but I, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but the one thing I do is forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, for I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the Bible. Lord, we do thank you for the nourishment it is for our soul. It does not need any help from me. It can preach all by itself. So we simply read your word, take it as you would, and divide it and place it into the lives of people where they're living. And may we walk out of this place changed today, transformed today by the power of your word. And God, we believe today that many people will come to know you in this room, that we will depopulate hell and overpopulate heaven in this room. And God, we love you and we honor it and we give you praise. And it's in Jesus' name I ask it. And everybody says amen and amen. If you're taking notes, I've tagged the title today, Heaven on My Mind. Heaven on My Mind. I had the honor uh, this past week uh, to do a funeral for a pastor I had met uh, several months ago. Uh, his grandkids attend our church, and uh, they came to me several months ago and said, hey, my, my grandpa is in the hospital. He's got uh, cancer in his lungs and cancer on his brain, and we would love for you to stop and pray. And so uh, I did what every faith-filled preacher does. He walks in the room with oil and anoints him with oil and, and prays the, the prayer of faith and prays the prayer of healing. And, and in those moments, I... I, I I had one regret and that I didn't meet him sooner. I went to encourage him and he in turn encouraged me. And uh, this past week we, we celebrated his home going on Wednesday. It was a week before that on Friday that he had passed away and we got the call. And so we went to his house and met with his wife. And his wife, when we walked in the door, one of the first things out of her mouth that really hit me hard was she said, look outside, what a beautiful day it is to have a one-way trip to heaven. And I thought, and I, I, she said that, that resonated with me. I never got it out of my heart. I wrote it in my phone. And uh, from that moment on for the next, it's been, it's been 10 days now that I have not, not got that phrase. What a beautiful day it is to make a one-way trip to heaven. Uh, he, was a, he was a great man of God. Served 50 years faithfully in the ministry. Was married 63, year, 63 years to the same woman. And this guy was, uh, both of those are rare traits in our country today, by the way that he was faithful to the ministry for 50 years and faithful to one woman for 63 years. He was a blessing to my life, and um, I'm better because I met him, and I want to honor him before I even preach today. Pastor Robert Kennedy, uh, he, is, he is walking on those streets of gold today uh, with his Savior, Jesus Christ, and if he came back, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be able to come back if he wanted to come back, and so I want to pause just for a minute and honor him and his life and his legacy, and I want you to know that I'm better because I met him. And uh, my wife and I are better because we met in the times that we shared in the hospital. But what a beautiful day it is to, ha to, to have a one-way trip to heaven. I've got heaven on my mind. The Apostle Paul, if you study the Bible, you study the life of the, of the Apostle Paul, you'll see a theme when it comes to he and, 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 and a place called Rome. Paul desired more than anything to go to Rome. He, he desired to be in Rome. He, he was obsessive compulsive over going to this place called Rome. And I believe the Holy Spirit put the city of Rome in Paul's heart. And when I study the Bible, places without a doubt are important to God. Places without a doubt, they, they, they matter to God. Places are important. As a matter of fact, God created places before he created people. Before he created Adam and Eve, he first created the garden. The garden was a place. Places matter to God. Over 1,100 times, if you study the scripture, you'll see where God told people to go over there and to get to that place. And if you'd get to that place, I will speak to you there. I will, I will bless you at that place. I will provide for you at that place. I will heal you at that place. I will meet you at that place. I will provide for you at that place. I will show up for you at that place. In other words, what you cannot get in this place 
what you cannot get to happen here can and will happen when you get to the new place. And so the tension that we're wrestling with today in scripture, but also in our life is this, before we can reach a new place, we first have to be willing to say goodbye to an old place. And so, and I'm not talking about just leaving earth into a place called heaven, but before you can enter into a new place of freedom, you've got to be willing to wave goodbye to the life of bondage. Before you can enter a new, into a new way of thinking, you've got to say goodbye to the old way of thinking. Before you can walk in and say, I'm set free, for, uh, I'm set free from the blood of Christ, by, by the blood of Christ, you've got to be willing to say goodbye to the chains that are currently holding you hostage. Before you can say yes to freedom, you've got to be willing to say no to alcoholism. Before you can say yes to freedom, you've got to be willing to say no to drug addiction. You gotta, before you can say yes to freedom, you've got to be willing to say no to nicotine, nicotine addiction. And before, if you want to get something in the new place, I'm here to tell you, before you can get to the new place, you've got to be willing to say goodbye to the old place. And so I, I just believe, just like the Holy Spirit put Rome in the heart of Paul, that if you're a Christian today, in other words, you've put your faith in Christ, then, 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 then God himself has put the hope of heaven in our heart. I've got heaven on my mind. I don't know where you're going through today or what you're facing or what you walked in here carrying. I don't know what sin you've got in your life. I don't know what skeletons you've got in your closet. I don't know what things are tripping you up in your faith walk. I don't know what thoughts you're thinking, what issues you're having, what struggles that nobody else knows you're walking with. I do not know exactly what it is that you're carrying or what, what it is that is being represented in your life today. But I will tell you this, God sees it, God knows it, and God cares about it. Not only does he know it, does he care about it, but he knows you and he cares about you. His eye is on you today. He knows exactly what you need before you even utter it. God is in control of your life. He's in control of your circumstances. The Bible says when we don't understand and we really don't know what's going on, the Bible says he's still with us and leading us. And as a matter of fact, the Bible says that it, this, this way that all things are working together for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. Here's what I know. You're either living one of two ways. You're living, uh, you, you're living with, with, with God in control of your life or you're living with, with you in control of your life. You've either made the decision that, hey, God's ways are better than my ways. I'm going to relinquish control to him and he's leading me and he's guiding me and he's making a way for me and he's providing for me. Or you're, you're living your life with you under control of it and you manipulating it and you making the decisions. And a lot of times we fall on the second end of that decision, not because God's not good and God's not able, but God doesn't necessarily move in the time frame that we think he should move in. And so instead of us releasing and relinquishing control to him, we want to hold on to it because we think we can get through it quicker and better. But what I've come to know is if we can just stay holding on to God, even when times are tough and even when times are difficult, if we can learn to trust in God and let God lead us when we get through the trial, and I tell you this, God will take you through it quicker than you can take it through yourself. And when you get through it with God, you'll turn around and say, yep, I saw God back there. Now I know why God caused me there. Now I know it was God's hand there. Now I saw God open up the door there. That's where the crooked path was made straight. That's where God created the friendship. That's where God answered my need. That's where God made the way. When we get on the other side, it's easy to turn around and see how faithful God was during the times we doubted he was, he was even with us. Come on, the Bible says he's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And so I've been wrestling with this place called heaven since my time with Mary when she said, what a beautiful day it is to have a one-way trip to heaven. I've been wrestling with this thing called heaven. Not wrestling with its existence, but, but wrestling with what am I doing to make it full. So the question I want to pose to everybody in the room today is this. Are the things that you're living for, were they worth Jesus dying for? Are, are the things that, this, this is what I'm asking myself. And the, are the things that I'm living for, were they worth Jesus dying for? And so the same question I'm asking myself, I'm trying to ask yourself today. Are the things you're putting stock in, are, is, is the time that you're spending, is the money that you're giving, is the witness that you are living in, the decisions that you are making, the way you're raising your kids, are the things you're living for, were they worth Jesus dying for? 
Here's what I know. I've got heaven on my mind. Heaven is a real place. It's a real place. And you can't imagine how awesome it is when we get there. Hallmark has portrayed heaven as a place of white fluffy clouds and overweight angels strumming harps. That's not the place of heaven that I'm going to. Hallmark promotes heaven as a place where estrogen is everywhere. Cupid and arrows are everywhere. That's the hallmark version of heaven, but not the biblical view of heaven. The heaven that I read about is the place where Jesus is on the throne. It's a place where perfection exists. I believe heaven is a loud place. I believe heaven is a bright place. I believe heaven is a 24-7, 365 party. How can you say that? Because Jesus is on his throne in a place called heaven. Heaven has a place, it's a place of streets of gold. The Bible says streets of gold, walls of jasper, and gates of pearl. The Bible also talks about a place called heaven. It's a place that you'll walk into and be, be able to talk to the great saints of old. That one day you'll be able to walk through the gates and you'll be able to look up Abraham. Pull up a chair and talk to Father Abraham, the father of many nations. You'll be, you, I think you'll be able to find King David and let him tell you the story about he slung that, how he slung that stone to the giant. We'll be able to find Moses and find the Apostle Paul, find all the great heroes of faith that we've simply read on paper, but one day we'll be able to sit across the table and meet him one-on-one -on -one and hear the stories that we only read about, but now we get a fresh perspective by talking. Can you imagine what a day that will be? Come on, I sang a song growing up, what a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, and when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day, what a glorious day that will be. That's how I grew up singing. I got heaven on my mind today. He heaven is a real place, and you can't imagine how awesome it is. I don't know about you, but heaven is where I'm headed. This isn't my forever home. This is, this, the Bible calls us a pilgrim passing through this land. Heaven is our reward as Christ's followers. Are, do you get saved to go to heaven? No, you don't get saved to go to heaven. You get saved because you're aware of just who Jesus Christ is to you. Heaven is the reward for you getting saved and living sold out for Christ. Come on, I'm excited about a place called heaven. I don't know about you, but heaven is where I'm going. Heaven is my reward. Heaven is my forever home. And Heaven is where I'm headed. I just, want, I just, I, I just guess that the older I get, look at my age, says, you know, I don't, I'm, I'm over halfway through. Unless, unless I, I, I somehow gain real favor with God, I've got about 30 good years left. And the question I'm asking myself is for the next 30 years is the thing that I'm living for, what Jesus dying for? I guess I'm, what I'm trying to say is I just, I'm just fully aware that, that if Jesus said he's going to prepare a place for me, and if he prepares a place for me, he's going to come back and get me and take me to where he is forever. And the problem that I have with the local church and the modern day church culture is we very rarely ever talk about this place called heaven. Heaven is the hope that we have. For a place forever and with eternity with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. What it will be like, I don't know, but it's going to be better than this old world. Here's what I got wrote down. Don't let the devil, don't let the enemy take the hope of heaven off your radar. Don't let the enemy take the hope of heaven off of our radar. What's the opposite of heaven? A place called hell. You don't hear that preached a lot in modern day church, but just as real as heaven is, so is hell. The Bible says it's God's will that none should perish, but all would come to know Christ. God is sending nobody to hell. People are sending themselves there by the rejection of the finished work of the cross of Jesus Christ. 
Come on, I got heaven on my mind. And so just as Jesus was here and gone, Jesus is also coming back again. Jesus didn't just, di he didn't just die, but he also rose again. And when he rose again, he made this promise that this same Jesus in like manner will, uh, will come again. And one of these days, the clouds are going to part. One of these days, Jesus is going to come riding back on that white horse. One day, that eastern sky is going to split. He's going to put, put an end to this old world. And those that us that it remains shall be caught up in the air with him. And forever and ever we shall rule and reign with Jesus Christ our Lord. That's a good place to shout amen if heaven is your reward and heaven is your hope. I'm talking about a place for eternity with God our Savior. I got heaven on my mind. You know what I think irritates the devil the most? Why, why he really hates us Christian people the most? It's because we are going to be entitled to the place that he was kicked out of. And if he's trying to stop us from getting there, that should be a dead sign that what's there is worth fighting for. He can tell you it's not that big of a deal. He can tell, tell you it's not that amazing. He can tell you that it's not that wonderful. But I, I read the book. It is an amazing place. It is a wonderful place. And one day we will be there and our eyes will see our creator once and for all. And we will see our loved ones that have gone on before. And we will see King Jesus. And we will see all the great saints. Come on, we'll see how perfect. If you, heaven is a real place and you can't imagine how awesome it is. There's some beautiful places in this world, but they all pale in comparison to how beautiful heaven is. If Hawaii is that breathtaking and beautiful, how much more majestic is this place called heaven? If Jesus has been preparing the place this whole time while we're here, and just a few days he created all that we see in the earth, how much more majestic will this place called heaven be? And so the devil must drive him crazy knowing that we're, about to, we're, we're going to walk into the place that he was kicked out of. Here's what I know. He loves, to whispers lies. he loves to whisper lies like it's not real. Everyone's going to get there. All, relig all roads and religions lead to heaven. Go ahead and live it up. Do what makes you happy. There is no consequence. Hell's not real. Just do whatever makes you feel good. Just do whatever makes you feel right. Don't worry about what happens tomorrow. You've got plenty of time to find Christ. You've got plenty of time to get right with God. But you're young and you've got the, your whole world ahead of you. Don't worry about giving your heart to Christ. You've got all kinds of time. Let me tell you, tomorrow is promised to no man. And so today in our culture, and even in some church cultures, we are seeing people thirst after a watered-down version of the real gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to go to a church where the, the pastor preaches the love is love gospel and we want to go to a church where everybody's going to make it gospel and all that's awesome and all that makes, makes me happy, but that is not the real gospel. We want a no consequence gospel. We want a grace all the time gospel. But let me tell you something about sin. Sin destroys. Sin will thrill and then it will kill. Sin will fascinate and then it will assassinate. Sin is not your friend. Sin is not something to mess with. Sin is not something to play with. But sin is a liar. Sin is an isolator. And sin is a destroyer. Sin is a lot like cancer. If you don't attack it, then it will attack you. The Bible says, for we all, in Romans 3.23, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The answer to sin is the blood of Jesus. The way to heaven, there's only one way, and it's through the Son, Jesus Christ. He's the doorway, he's the gatekeeper, and no man or woman gets to the Father without first coming through the Son. That's Bible, that's gospel. The answer to, to, to sin and forgiveness is having a repentant heart. The only way that you get born again is acknowledging that you're a sinner and you need the grace and, and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. It's called repenting. 
It's called knowing that, man, I'm, I messed up, I've fallen short, I'm living a life outside of the will of God. I, I, I know that if it was not for the blood of Christ, I cannot enter in. And so it's a, having a repentant heart where one day you say, Jesus, would you forgive me and come in and may, be Lord of my life. And from that day, you turn and start living a life of difference. That's what repentance means. The answer to sin and the answer to the fallen world is the grace of of Jesus Christ is to shed blood on the cross of Jesus Christ. I've got wrote down that sin is no match for the amazing grace of God. What are you trying to say? I'm saying there's no sin that Jesus Christ can't cover. I don't care what you came in here with, what your past is, what you did on the way to church, what you did last night. There is no sin that Jesus Christ cannot cover. There is no person that Jesus Christ cannot save. There is no person too far that God's hand cannot reach and pull back. Are you hearing what I'm preaching today? There's nobody too far gone. There's nobody too jacked up. There's nobody too lost that Jesus Christ cannot save. Why don't we take 15 seconds and thank him for saving you? Why don't we just stretch out a little bit and maybe get up and stretch a little bit? I've been working hard this morning. You've been sitting there. Why don't we thank God for saving my life? Come on, you weren't always saved. You weren't always good. He didn't have to forgive you and save you and pull you up out, but he did. That's why he's worthy to be praised. He's worthy to be praised. Why you do those praise breaks anywhere? Because it's in the Bible. Where? A few weeks ago, seven times a day shall I praise thee. What was David doing? He was taking a good old-fashioned praise break. Well, I don't really like standing up. It's church. Can I sit down? No, we can. No. You need to shake the dust off your tushy, honey, and stand up. We need more praise breaks in the church. We need that. When you, when you stand up and start giving God praise, something happens to your spirit. Like, man, that felt good. I've never done that before. That, that's giving God what he, what he deserves and what he demands. Come on, I got heaven on my mind today. I studied heaven 1,865 times. It's mentioned in the Old Testament. 316 times it's mentioned in the New Testament. Here's what I know. If it's mentioned that many times in the Bible, then I think we should be talking about it in the church. As a matter of fact, it's why we're still here. The last command Jesus gave his church was to make sure you go into all the world making disciples and baptizing people in my name. What's he trying to do? I want you to populate the place I'm going to. I'm going to prepare a place and I don't want it to be empty, I want it to be full. And so if, if, if it's mentioned that many times, we should be singing about heaven, we should be talking about heaven, we should be preaching way more about heaven, we should be thinking about heaven, we should be living with heaven on our mind. How about this, we should be recruiting for this place called heaven. I'm glad you're going, but you got family members that aren't. I got family members that aren't. Yeah, I'm on my way there. Yeah, my reservation's booked. Yeah, I know that's where I am, but, but I'm not satisfied with just getting me there. I want to get as many people as I can there. Philippians 3 tells us this, that our citizenship is in a place called heaven, not earth. James 4 says that our life is a vapor. Here today, gone tomorrow. Second Peter says, one day of the Lord is like a thousand in heaven. Here's what I know. Heaven is a real place. It's not a state of mind. It's not some imaginary place. It's not some mystical city. It's not some made-up place in Scripture. But I've come to tell you that heaven is a real place, and it was created for me, and it was created for you. And if it weren't a real place, then why would Jesus have promised that he's going away to prepare a place? And if he was going to prepare a place, the Bible, Jesus actually said, in my father's house are many rooms. And if Jesus talked about heaven and Jesus was on his way to heaven and Jesus said he's going to prepare a place for us in heaven, don't tell me heaven's not real. Heaven is a real place and you can't imagine how awesome that it is. How do I get there? Well, let me tell you how you can't get there. Church membership won't get you there. Crying tears won't get you there. Good works won't get you there. 
Intellect can't save you. Money can't save you. Influence can't save you. Religion can't save you. There is only one way to get to this place called heaven, and it's through the shed blood of the Son, Jesus Christ. He's not a way. He's the way. He's not a truth. He's the truth. And the Bible says he's also the life. Come on, he's the only way. He's the way. He's the only way. Let me tell you, streets of gold, walls of jasper, gates gates of pearl. It's a place where there is nothing but peace, constant joy. We'll be able to see Jesus Christ in all of his fullness. We will see the scars. This place called heaven will be our reward for all of eternity. You may have struggles here, but you won't have struggles there. You may be sick here. You won't be sick there. You may be addicted here. You won't be addicted there. You may have depression here. You won't find depression there. You may have heartache here. You won't have heartache there. Come on, one day I walk through the gates of heaven. I'll see my grandma. I'll see my grandpa. I'll see the guys and girls that went on before me. One day I'll be at this place called heaven. And this land called heaven will be the final land, the final place that I inherit. A place where we're headed. Let me tell you about this place called heaven. There, are no, there is no sorrow. There is no tears. There is no pain. There is no loss. There is no heartache. There is no addiction. There is no worry. There is no dieting. There is no anxiety. There is no depression. There is no sadness. There is no weeping. There's no funeral homes. There's no funerals. There's no hospitals, there's no sleepless nights, there's no gangs, there's no negativity, there is no president, there is no Congress, there is no Senate, there is no Democrat, there is no Republican, there are no shootings, there are no sex trafficking, there are no child abductions, there are no recovery centers, there is no suicide, there is no racial tension, there are no acts of terrorism, there are no divorce, there is no hurt feelings, there are no bad habits. There are no depression, there is no medication, there is no war, there is no rape, there is no temptation, there is no cancer. Come on, simply put, it's a place of absolute perfection in this place called heaven. Come on, church, I got heaven on my mind. Come on, I'm going to heaven. I'm RSVP'd, are you? Are you assured of heaven today? Is your name wrote down in the Lamb's Book of Life today? Come on, we're all headed somewhere today. We're all headed somewhere. If you're not standing, jump up. I'm going to close this thing right now. Here's what I know. In our culture, we're addicted to saving things. Save the trees. Save the sea turtles. Save the planet. We're obsessed with saving everything we can't save. But the one thing that we can control, what is saved, is us. We can't, I'm all for saving the planet and saving the sea turtles and saving whatever. But but we, we, we can't save those things. But today, at 12, 11 on a Sunday afternoon, you can be in the right position to let Jesus save you. In other words, you may not be able to save the planet, but you can get your soul saved today. You can make the reservation today in this place called heaven I've been preaching about. Don't you put it off the next week. Don't you wait for, for next month. Don't you wait till your mom's here, your, your wife's here. No, it is promised to no man another day that we should live. And so why don't we just take a moment to get right with God today?